Okay, welcome again to the second part of our lecture on expert systems and what is wrong with them. In the first part, we describe generally how an expert system works, uh, what its different parts are, and the people who build it, all these different uh, specialties, uh, the knowledge engineer and uh, the system designer and so on. And so now we will talk um, more specifically about the criticism. Um, one critic, uh, not only of expert systems, but of symbolic AI in general, is Hubert Dreyfus who um, was very influential. Um, he, let's see one moment, um, he died recently, um, two years ago or something, and he wrote this article from Socrates to Expert Systems, which is what we will talk about uh, today. And in this article he tries not only to criticize expert systems, but to criticize symbolic AI in general um, with the example of expert systems. And um, he says, he begins his criticism by saying, behind the idea of an expert system are a few assumptions, and these assumptions are in themselves questionable. So one assumption is that experts follow clear black and white rules. So, um, the idea that what makes an expert is that the expert has these rules for his expertise and following the rules is what makes him an expert. Uh, he knows rules that other people don't. And so if you take out the rules from the expert and put these rules into an expert system, you get an, a system that is an expert too because it has these rules. So you can extract the expertise in form of symbolic rules, put it into a machine, and everyone who has these rules to follow will then be an expert. This is the idea behind the expert system, right? But this does not need to be true. And you see that we can criticize all those one by one. Um, we could question these assumptions. Experts perhaps don't follow clear black and white rules. Perhaps there is some kind of intuition in expertise. Uh, or what makes an expert an expert is perhaps not that he knows rules that other people don't. Perhaps there is something else that makes him into an expert. And we will see in a moment how Dreyfus questions these assumptions. So he begins with a question, what is an expert system? Does it really model what a human expert does? And in order to get an idea, uh, you can think, are you experts in anything? I mean, everybody is an expert in something, right? You, Some of you perhaps can play the piano. Uh, some of you are uh, experts in playing the guitar, or you are experts in chess, or you can drive a car or a bicycle. You are an expert in riding a bike. Uh, all these things you have to learn. You are not born with these abilities. They are things you learn and you improve uh, at them. You become better and better. At some point you are an expert in this kind of activity. And now you can, um, you know, many other things, computer games, Chinese calligraphy, whatever. And, and all of you are experts in basic abilities like writing, reading. You are all experts in taking lecture notes. Um, in, in walking, in jumping over obstacles, you know, in running. Um, so there are so many skills and abilities that we have, and we have practiced them, and we have become experts in them. And we can draw on this. We can say, let us consider, you know, our own expertise, take something in which you are an expert, and now think, is it true that your expertise works in this way, like we said before? Is it true that you follow rules in your expertise? that these rules um, are what make you an expert and and if you took these rules out of your brain, you put them into an expert system, then somebody who has access to these rules would also be an expert. Is this really true? Is this how it works? How did you become an expert? Did you become an expert because somebody gave you these rules and you incorporated them into your brain and then you are, you now are an expert because you have these rules or not? And, and Dreyfus says, let's think about it. So there are stages in the development of expertise. Clearly, at one point you were not an expert and then you were um, somebody who had the basic ability but not yet an expert and then you became better and better and better and then finally you became an expert. So... He says we all begin as um, by 
recognizing features of a situation and reacting to them. So the student car driver, he begins with the example of somebody who learns to drive a car, learns to recognize such interpretation-free features as speed as indicated by the speedometer of your car. Um, Interpretation-free means that you don't need any interpretation, you don't need any expertise in order to judge the speed of the car. It is given to you um, in a way that you can directly read the number and everybody can read the number no matter whether they are an expert or not. Um, so this is an interpretation-free feature that is available to everybody. And then you are given rules when you learn to ride the car, drive a car, such as to shift to second gear when the needle points at 10 miles an hour. So now you're going 10 miles an hour and this means you have to shift your gear. Uh, the novice chess player learns a numerical value for each type of piece regardless of its position and then the rule always exchange if the total value of pieces captured exceeds the value of pieces lost. So you have these chess pieces and you learn you know the, the rook is five and the um, knights are three and so on and the pawns in front are, are have the value of one and so if you can exchange three pawns with one knight then you're doing fine um, because the value is equal and then they, you also get some additional rules um, you have to move uh, towards the center uh, you should not do the same, you should not move the same piece twice in the beginning of the game. Um, and so you're given some rules like that to follow. And in this way you are able to play the game at a novice uh, level. You are not good at it, but you are. you can make legal moves and you don't play terribly wrong. Right? You don't make random moves, um, random legal moves. You make moves that somehow seem to make some sense, but you're not an expert yet. So most beginners are very slow players because they attempt to remember all these features and rules. And now when you are an advanced beginner, you get a little better. Uh, you begin to note example of additional aspects of the situation that are not any more directly described in the rules. So for example uh, you learn to recognize uh, new aspects of the situation as well as the non-situational features that you had as a rule. What does this mean? It means that when you begin to drive you start paying attention at the engine sounds. So now you have the gear shifting uh, and you have the rule that depends on the speed but now because you are an advanced beginner you also hear that the engine is doing something and if the engine sounds like um, it is too loud, it's, it's turning too fast then you know you have to use the next gear or when you hear that the engine is making these straining noises because um, it, um, um, you know, you, you have a too high gear, then you have to make, you have to put your gear down, uh, shift down. So this is the um, thing. So you start to have some appreciation of this situational um, environment in which you operate your car. Um, you also observe, you know, the position and velocity of pedestrians and other drivers and you can distinguish the behavior of a distracted or a drunken driver from an impatient one uh, and from an alert one and so on. So you have all kinds of, th these are not rules anymore, explicit rules, they are aspects of the situation that you learn to distinguish. And these cannot be captured by words, uh, so the words cannot take the place of a few examples. This is why you cannot be given these rules as rules in advance. You have to learn them through practice, through expertise, through driving. The same with a chess beginner. He learns to recognize positions as a weakened king side, a strong pawn structure. Um, and although there is no good definition of a strong pawn structure, every advanced beginner learns to recognize one. Uh, you can see that this is good for you or this is bad for you. Right? 
So then the player can follow new rules like attack a weakened king side, although there is no precise definition of what a weakened king side is, uh, the player is still able to identify one and react to it. And then you have more and more experience, so there are so many relevant elements now that you might recognize that this soon becomes overwhelming. So the competent performer needs to learn some rules to simplify things. Um, the student wonders how anyone ever masters the skill because it's so complicated. And now they choose, people learn to devise a plan or choose a perspective and the perspective determines which elements of the situation should be treated as important and which one can be ignored, right? So now you need to learn to ignore things. Um, the situation is too complex, you perceive too many elements and you have to learn which of these elements can be safely ignored. Um, and then by restricting attention to only a few of the vast number of possibly relevant features, um, you have an easier time making a decision. For example, for example, let's say there, there's a lot of, of explanation here, but but we don't uh, need all these details in order to get the idea. Um, so let's let's jump to the example. The competent driver, after taking into account speed and surface condition and time and so on, may decide that he's going too fast. He then has to decide whether to let up on the accelerator, remove his foot altogether or step onto the brake um, and precisely when to do so. He's relieved when he gets through the curve without being uh, honked at and shaken if he begins to you know, lose control of his car. Um, the competent chess player may decide after studying a position that the opponent has weakened the king's defenses so an attack is a viable goal uh, and then she chooses to attack and she can ignore features involving weaknesses in her own position uh, and so on. Um, so what, what is important here is that the um, a competent performer now uh, starts to take responsibility for his decisions because previously he was just following the rules that were given to him. So he was not actually responsible. But now by deciding which features are important and which can be ignored, this is a decision of the performer herself. So uh, he or she can now um, be responsible for her actions because um, she has decided herself to ignore some features. And so when, when she ignores some features and loses, then she feels responsible for the loss. When she ignores some features and wins, then she feels um, euphoric because she is responsible for the good outcome, right? And uh, as the competent performer now becomes more and more emotionally involved, it becomes increasingly difficult to draw back and adopt the detached rule following, rule fo rule following stance of the beginner. So uh, the competent performer cannot go back and say, now I don't care, This is the these are the rules that my teacher gave me, because now the rules are not so important anymore. It's the decisions that the performer makes about um, what situational aspects to consider and how strongly to consider them. And uh, now we're going to the proficient stage, which it depends on seeing instead of calculating. So uh, the events are experienced with involvement and the resulting positive and negative experiences will strengthen successful responses and inhibit unsuccessful ones. This is what Rafo says. So the theory of the skill, as represented by rules, is gradually now replaced by situational discriminations accompanied by responses. So the, the performer more and more ignores the original rules and learns to rely on his own evaluation. And proficiency develop in parallel with the development of intuitive behavior, which replaces the reasoned responses based on the rules. Action becomes easy and less stressful because the learner sees what needs to be achieved rather than deciding which alternative should be selected. 
Um, let us see an example. The proficient driver approaching a curve on a rainy day may feel that he is going too fast. He is not looking at the speed. He is not looking anymore at rules about what speed you can use to take this curve and so on. He feels that this is too fast. Um, and he must decide whether to apply the brakes or to reduce pressure on the accelerator by some amount. The proficient chess player can recognize almost immediately uh, large numbers of positions and then she deliberates to determine which move will best achieve the goal. Um, and But still the chess player and the car driver have to decide what to do. They see the problem, but they don't see the solution. And now the expert stage is the next stage in which the proficient performer has so, many, so much experience that he sees what needs to be done. This is the proficient, right? It needs to be done, but must decide how to do it. But the expert now not only sees what needs to be achieved, but thanks to the experience, he sees how to achieve the goal. So he immediately has the result of how to do it. And the brain of the expert performer gradually decomposes the situations into subclasses, each of which shares the same action, and then he immediately knows what he's supposed to be doing. So the expert chess player experiences a sense of the issue and the best move, so he immediately knows what to play. And this is why expert chess players can, be, uh, can play uh, a move in five or ten seconds without thinking, without calculating, and they can play simultaneously. Um, many other players, uh, which wouldn't be possible if they, every time they had to calculate everything, right? They just see the board and they immediately see what to play in this situation. So at this speed, you need to depend entirely on intuition. Uh, there is no time for analysis and comparison of alternatives. And the same with driving, the expert driver. Uh, not only feels that he has to slow down, he knows uh, how much to slow down intuitively. So he automatically performs the action. So what is the conclusion from all this? We have a kind of ladder of expertise from the beginning to from the beginner to the expert. And in the beginner, you have the calculation of rules and facts. Mm -hmm. And so the beginner actually works like a computer, but with an increase of talent. Mm -hmm. The beginner develops into an expert who intuitively sees what to do without going back to the rules. And normally the expert does not calculate. Mm -hmm. He does not solve problems. He does not even think. He just does what normally works. And of course, it normally works, says Dreyfus. So the expert does not calculate. He just sees the problem and he immediately sees the solution because of this long expertise. And this allows us to understand why experts have trouble articulating their rules when the knowledge engineer comes to ask them what rules are you following so that I can put them into my expert system, the expert cannot actually say which rules he is following because experts are simply not following rules. They are instead discriminating thousands of special cases based on their intuition. And this explains why expert systems are never as good as experts. If one asks an expert for the rules he is using, one will in effect force the expert to regress to the level of a beginner and state the rules he learned at school. Right? So what you have in a system where you take the rules out of the expert and put them into the expert system, what you're creating is a beginner system, not an expert system, because experts don't follow rules. Beginners follow rules. And um, so if one programs these rules in a computer, one can use the speed and accuracy of the computer uh, to store and access millions of facts uh, and outdo a human beginner using the same rules. But these systems are at best competent performance because no amount of rules can capture the knowledge an expert has and the experience of the actual outcomes of tens of thousands of situations. And Hubert Dreyfus, therefore, attacks the basic assumption behind symbolic AI, calling it the psychological assumption and defines it as the mind can be viewed as a device operating on bits of information according to former rules. This is, he calls it the psychological assumption. 
Um, Dreyfus refutes this by showing that human intelligence and expertise depends primarily on unconscious instincts rather than conscious symbolic manipulation. Experts solve problems quickly by using their intuitions rather than step-by-step -step trial and error searches. But Dreyfus goes further than just this academic result. He warns that seeing rationality as rule-driven behavior poses great dangers to society. So it's not only that we cannot make expert systems. The problem is bigger. The, can you think why? What, what is the problem? Why is this a bigger problem than just creating expert systems? Think about this for a moment and then we'll continue. The calculative picture of reason underlies a general movement towards calculative rationality in our culture, and this movement brings with it great dangers, he says. So what is calculative rationality? The idea that rational decisions have to be based on rules and they have to be able to be calculated objectively. And this has to do with the increasingly bureaucratic nature of society, which means that society is controlled by rules. Uh, and rule systems that are abstract and have to be followed in a particular way. So skills and expertise that is not um, captured in rules will be lost through the over-reliance on calculative rationality. For example, judges serving on juries are beginning to distrust anything but scientific evidence. So imagine, for example, you have a ballistics expert, these people who look at bullets uh, flying into, you know, the body, you have a body lying there with some bullets in it, and the ballistics experts look at the body, and, and the expert can say, the bullet must have come from over there, from this balcony, because, you know, I know that seeing the bullet, I can say it entered in this way into the body. But then the judge might say, okay, how do you know this? Can you prove it? And what is the ballistics expert then supposed to be doing? So he has seen thousands of bullets. There is no doubt in his mind that the bullet in question comes from this gun, for example. Um, but if he says, I have no doubt about it, then this is not enough. The judge will say, where is the proof? And what counts as proof? What counts as proof is to show individual marks and to show the gun and to give the rules that connect the gun with the uh, uh, marks on the bullet, and then he can prove that the bullet came from this gun. But the problem is that this proof now is a beginner proof. It's not an expert proof. So calculative rationality in this case means a loss of expertise. Instead of using all the expertise of the expert, we are forcing him to reduce his expertise to the uh, level of these rules. And, and this is also, you know, in many other areas. We replace expert carpenters with industrially made furniture. So we lose the expertise in woodworking across all of society. Or, you know, when I uh, grade uh, students, um, also teachers grading students, you know, teachers have some expertise about judging students. So generally we know what grade a student deserves and we know it even when the particular piece of work, perhaps, if you follow the rules, it does not satisfy the criteria for an A because the student did something original. You know he has understood everything, you know he goes far beyond what he has to know and he has done something original and valuable and he would deserve an A, but now you have these list of, uh, you know, rubrics perhaps they are called or something like that. So these are criteria that the student's work has to satisfy. Has he used at least two arguments? Has he used, you know, good English and so on? And you have to use these for the grading. And if, for the marking of the work, and if the work is original and great and wonderful, but it does not satisfy these criteria, perhaps the students will get the student will get a C. And then you would know as an expert teacher that this is unfair. The student should not get a C, should he should have an A. But you're not allowed to give him an A because your grade has to be justified following these rules. Right? This is the problem. You lose the expertise of the teacher and you replace him, you make him into a machine who has to follow these particular rules. Um, 
So society must clearly distinguish its members who have intuitive expertise from those who have only calculative rationality. It must encourage its children to cultivate their intuitive capacities in order that they may achieve expertise, not encourage them to reason calculatively and thereby become human logic machines, is what Dreyfus says. In general, to preserve expertise, we must foster intuition at all levels of decision making, otherwise wisdom will become an endangered species of knowledge. So now, how could we solve the problems Dreyfus defies and, and, and how could we uh, design systems that don't have these problems? And one thing is AI systems, uh, only for AI, no, not for the general, you know, calculative rationality problem. AI systems should learn from expertise. This would give them some common sense knowledge of the world. So instead of feeding um, psych or an expert system with uh, formal rules that constitute knowledge, uh, these systems should have some common sense knowledge from experience, from their own experience of the world. And then they can generalize from existing knowledge. So we need systems that can do this, that can generalize, that can get some input of particular cases and from this uh, inductively um, uh, draw some conclusions. And uh, neural networks can do this, for example. Uh, systems should have additional sensors for all kinds of environmental conditions and a body that can act in the physical world. This would ad address also the symbol grounding problem and the Chinese room criticisms. The symbol grounding, you remember, means that uh, AI, symbolic AI systems, often have symbols in them, like in Prolog, the symbol cat, which doesn't mean anything because the Prolog system has no representation of a cat. Uh, it only has the symbol. So if we want to create a prolog system that um, does not have these problems of symbolic AI being rule-based uh, and not being really an expert because it doesn't have expertise and experience, therefore we need to give it experience and we would need to give it some sensors with which the program can actually see a cat. And from that it will be able then to build up a real expertise instead of being caught only in these formal rule systems. So truly intelligent behavior therefore probably needs a body and we will see later Rodney Brooks and others try to do exactly that to say that cognition needs a body, um, expertise needs a body, not uh, only because you know, a body gives you access to new rules but or, or to new manipulations of the environment for a robot, for example, but because the very nature of expertise requires experience gained through bodily action. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thank you so far. And we will stop here with that and, and then we talk more um, in the next session about other uh, symbolic AI systems uh, and their problems. And finally, you know, we will walk into um, areas uh, of not symbolic AI, sub symbolic AI that doesn't have these problems. Okay, so thank you. See you next time.